smoothie. Mm. Pear, banana. I forgot to put the lettuce in. <laughs> That's okay. Right. Now you got a little light sheen of something on your face. And we'll be fine because everybody can still see where I am. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer, welcoming you to October's episode of Night Skies at Home. Thanks a lot for joining us this evening. It's the first Thursday of the month, the night we normally do this program, always the first Thursday of the month, 7.45 p.m., and we're glad you could be with us this evening. You know, Night Skies at Home is a program that we've developed at the Franklin Institute during the pandemic period to substitute for our Night Skies at the Observatory program. Night Skies at the Observatory, when we held it at the Franklin Institute, is a program in which we invite visitors to come down and join us at the museum for all kinds of activities and programs related to astronomy, but organized around observing through the, uh, observing through the Franklin Institute's uh, observatory telescopes on the fourth floor. We have a great set of telescopes, including a large refractor that shows the moon and planets really, really well. We have a number of portable reflecting telescopes that we also use. And of course, we set up all that observing equipment for people to come in and see what's available to be seen in the night sky. Now, of course, doing that work from Center City, Philadelphia is a challenge, but there's so much that can be easily seen. And this program, Night Skies at Home, mirrors that program with one exception, and that is we don't have telescopes. But the idea of this program is to give you all the information you need so that you can make observations of the night sky, really great observations of the night sky from right where you live. And it doesn't really matter if you live in center city, Philadelphia, uh, or if you're way out in the suburbs someplace, there's plenty of stuff for you to see no matter where you are. You can do this from your front step, you can do this from your backyard, and there's plenty to be seen. So we're gonna cover a number of those items that you can see this evening. Some will be really easy, others will be a little bit of a challenge, but still well within your reach to do. And all of this actually is meant to give you an understanding of the context of the night sky. You know, often people look up at the night sky, see all those dots across the sky, and immediately become intimidated because there's no set pattern of organization that they can bring to it right away. Well, guess what? You actually already know a lot of this information, and all I'm going to do is just help you put it into a context in which you can use it most easily. And you know some of the words and terms that go along with this, but we're just going to organize that in a way that you can make it most easily usable for you. Okay, so we'll talk about all sorts of things tonight. You know, one of the most important messages that I can bring to you, of course, is when you're out in public, wear a mask. That's all I got to say, wear a mask. You know why, the science tells you why, and I know you get it, so please don't forget, wear a mask for you, and for everybody else you care for as well. Okay, hey, thanks a lot for that. So we're also gonna talk about astronomy equipment tonight. Now I know in previous episodes of this program, we've talked about astronomy equipment, binoculars, telescopes, things like that. But the reason why we're gonna talk about it now is because it's October. And that means that if you're thinking about perhaps getting an astronomy gift for someone around the winter holidays, then you need to be prepared for that now. Okay, because what I'm gonna suggest you do is I'm going to suggest you do it by mail order. Order it online. We'll talk about the logic of that in just a few minutes, but that's why we're going to talk about this now. Of course, we want your astronomy questions. Please send us your astronomy questions. If you have a question about uh, whether or not uh, the, the, you know, the, they're, they're, whatever your astronomy question is, whether it's dark matter and dark energy, black holes or planets or stars or any of those kinds of things, please send us your question, 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 question. Don't be too easy or it's not a good question or it's some people say I have a, I have a stupid question. Well, there's no such thing as that. You have a question. Guess what? Many other people have your same question and maybe they didn't write it in, but I want you to write in your question, send it to us and we'll answer it. Okay. So please do that. Oh, when I say we, I'm here with my, uh, my producer right here and floor director, uh, the lovely Linda over there in the corner. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Hey, there's my producer right over there. Okay, and in the background, of course, is my technical producer. Hi, Katie, thanks a lot for putting all this together. Uh, also this month, we're gonna talk about the moon. We talked about the moon a little bit last month, but now this month, we're gonna talk about the moon because there's one special moon. Oh, just a moment. 
there are two special moons. Why? Because there are two full moons this month. That's unusual. And you all know the term for that phenomenon when there are two full moons in a month? Yes, it goes along with a song that comes from the early 1960s. Blue moon, blue, blue moon. Did, 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 blue, 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 blue moon. Yeah, okay, I'll keep my day job, don't worry. Anyway, blue moon, that's what this phenomenon is called. But is the moon really blue? No, it isn't. We'll get into the reasons why and how this can happen because tonight is full moon. So this is the first one. And if the sky is clear where you are, Go out and take a look, see if it looks blue to you. I'll bet it doesn't. Okay, also we have some fall constellations and planets we're gonna talk about tonight. And we're also gonna talk about the mysticism and the astronomy that work together that create this magical month of October. Magical, why? Because at the end of the month, October 31st, you know what day that is, right? Yep, that's right, it's Halloween. And Halloween is connected to astronomy and it's also collected, connected to a number of other uh, cultural, um, um, uh, cultural uh, constructs that we all put together around this time of year. And we're gonna put all that together for you tonight too. Uh, there's some special launches to look out for this month. We'll talk about those. And of course, don't forget your questions. We want your questions, okay? So let's have that. And also during the program, we're gonna jump off onto my, uh, off, onto my desktop and we'll roam around uh, through some programs that you might find useful and helpful for information. Okay, so first of all, I got to do a couple of greetings tonight. Uh, I want to give a special birthday shout out to my youngest niece, Julia, whose birthday was yesterday. Hi, Julia. I don't know if you're watching, but you can catch it on YouTube. Happy birthday to you. And uh, also, I want to give a shout out to the Night Skies at the Observatory volunteers who worked with me for such a long time. 12 years with this program every month, month in and month out, all through the year to bring that wonderful program to the Franklin Institute audience. You know, we did that program once a month for as many years as I mentioned, and our regular volunteers, who, some of whom just came in for that one program along, helped thousands of people see the night sky in a new way for the first time. These were the people that uh, operated the telescopes for me in the observatory and up on the fifth floor roof deck. They operated the big Zeiss telescope. They operated the smaller reflecting telescopes. And you know, these great volunteers were out in the observatory, no matter what the weather was. And I'm talking about temperature wise, because of course we didn't have the place open when it was raining. But in the winter, up on the fifth floor roof deck, cold and windy with a telescope, they were out there helping people see the night sky and observe planets and the moon for the first time through a big piece of equipment. And I really do appreciate the work that they did. Their dedication and their professionalism really made them stand out and made that program sing. So to those people, if you're on tonight, and I hope you are, I want to say a special thank you for helping me with that program. You really made up the basis of one of the most important programs at the Franklin Institute. And from that group, a special shout out to my good friend, Dave F. Hey, Dave. How are you? I hope the horses are doing okay. And also to Art. Art, uh, Art, thanks a lot for the article you sent me, Art. I greatly appreciate it. Yes, I remember that photograph from that long ago in Paris. So thanks a lot for sending that photograph. And to Dave W. Hey, thank you, Dave, for your years of work in the planetarium, uh, helping as a volunteer. That's greatly appreciated. To everybody out there, all those volunteers, uh, uh, Suzanne as well, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to getting back to the Franklin Institute sometime soon. Hope to see you all there again when we do that program. All right, great. So that's it for all that stuff for introduction. Let's get rolling with the program. And uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the sky phenomenon. Let's get that out of the way first, because uh, some things have changed since we last met. You know, it was a month ago when we did this program last. And I got to tell you, the sunset times have changed still again. Of course, back when we did this program in September, sunset was around 6.30. Sunset is now at 6.57. Oh, sorry, my bad. Sunrise was at, sunrise, there we go, was at 6.30, and sunrise is now at 6.57 a.m. Sunset, on the other hand, is now at 6.42 p.m., earlier by 20 minutes than it was the last time we met. And this phenomenon is going to keep moving in this direction of later sunrises and earlier sunsets until we get down to the winter solstice a couple of months from now. We've lost three hours and 16 minutes 
since the summer solstice. So guess what? Now it's just under three hours before we get to the winter solstice. So we're almost closer to winter than we were to summer, okay? We're getting close to the halfway point, but right around there. So sunrise is now just before seven o'clock in the morning. Sunset is now 6.45 in the evening, okay? So that's the way the setup goes. Uh, the moon today, the moon is full. So mark your calendars. Tonight happens to be the first full moon of the month. And this particular one has a special name. This is the one that's called the harvest moon. And the harvest moon is that moon that uh, uh, farmers would use, uh, say maybe a hundred years ago or so, to illuminate the fields at night as they were harvesting crops just after, as the harvest season was getting underway. As they needed to harvest their crops, well, what they needed to do was to stay out as long as they could to get those crops in. And so the rising moon at this time of the year provided that extra light right after sunset. Now, it might seem as if maybe it's a little late for that now. And that's because the harvest moon this year comes a little late. The harvest moon is typically the first full moon after the autumnal equinox. And usually, or I should say closest to the autumnal equinox. That's the way it goes. The harvest moon is the full moon that's closest to the autumnal equinox. This one happens to be closest to that first day of fall. And so the added light as it's rising helps the farmers see as they're harvesting crops from the field. Uh, but guess what? In this modern day and age, you know, the farm equipment that's used nowadays is very much like your, uh, just like a car that you might have in terms of uh, accessories that it has, air conditioning, GPS, headlights, radio, all that sort of stuff. So they don't need to use the moon anymore for this. They can use the headlights to do that, but we still hold on to that piece from the past of this being the harvest moon. The other moon that comes at the end of the month will be called the hunter's moon. So the full moon that comes on October 31st this year, that will be the hunter's moon, okay? Now, when we talk about these moons, Let's just get this phenomenon out of the way, which is the blue moon phenomenon. As it turns out, this is the term that has come to be used for this particular phenomenon. But guess what? The moon doesn't actually look blue, so why do we call it that? Well, hundreds of years ago, the term blue moon was actually a reference to something that was an extremely rare event. You would say, well, I won't see them again uh, for once in a blue moon. You know, I'll only see them once in a blue moon or this particular thing happens only once in a blue moon. And that was the reference to the idea that the moon was hardly ever blue. Now, there have been instances where the moon has had a slightly bluish color to it. And that has been the result of volcanic eruptions, very, very active volcanic eruptions that throw dust into the atmosphere that refract light in such a way that we only get to see blue as the, uh, as the appearance of the moon. The moon itself isn't blue, but the dust in the atmosphere causes it to look blue. So under that circumstance, you could have a blue appearing moon, but guess what? That's a really, really rare event. And that's the reason why it was called that. So now two moons in a month, how does it get to be called a blue moon? Well, about 60 years ago, there was an article published in an astronomy magazine that mistakenly referred to the term blue moon as being connected to this phenomenon of two full moons in a month. It was a mistake. A few months later, the magazine retracted that and admitted that it was a mistake. But by then, the idea had already caught on and people were using the term blue moon to refer to two full moons in a month. So as it turns out, this mistake has carried on and we still use it today to describe two full moons in a month. So don't expect the moon to look blue. If you have a clear sky tonight, you won't see it looking blue. And on the 31st, it won't look blue either. But just remember, that's where the term comes from. Okay, so now what's great to see this month in the evening sky? Well, as it turns out, there are great planets that are really, really well positioned for us to see in the evening sky. And also, there are really fabulous constellations coming into view. So let's do this. Why don't we shift things over here and uh, let's jump uh, up. I was gonna say, let's jump uh, out to a sky map and take a look at that. But before we do that, let's see if we have any questions that we can uh, take right now. And we'll get a couple of questions out of the way. And then we'll go look at a star map and see where the planets are and see what constellations are available this time of the year. Uh, so Linda, anything? What planets will be visible Saturday night? Ha ha ha, there we are. We started right away with what planets will be visible Saturday night. 
Well, it depends what time you're out viewing. If you go out just after sunset, just after the sky gets dark and you look toward the south, look toward the south, the brightest object you'll see, a small bright dot, what appears as a small bright dot, that will be the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is easy to see in the south as the sky darkens. Now, as you're facing south, just to the left of Jupiter, a little bit, a little ways away, but not very far, there's a smaller bright object that you'll see, and that's the planet Saturn. Saturn. So you can easily see Jupiter and you can easily see Saturn. No telescope, no binoculars needed. Now, if you do have a pair of binoculars, get them out and take a look at Jupiter with them and also take a look at Saturn. Your binoculars have more magnifying power than Galileo's first telescope. So get your binoculars out, give them a shot, a shot and see what you can see of Jupiter. If you have a small telescope that's been sitting around in a closet all summer, please drag it out, set it up and try to get it to view Jupiter for you. You'll be astonished at what you see. And particularly because once you get it set up and working on Jupiter fine, you can go over and look at Saturn and you'll be able to see the rings. You will really, really like that view. All right, if you're out a little bit later, say you're out around midnight, well, and you've identified where Jupiter and Saturn are, keep going a little bit further over to the left. That's gonna to be toward the direction east, and you'll be able to see a smaller, but definitely rosy colored dot that doesn't twinkle. Just like Jupiter and Saturn don't twinkle, this other rosy one doesn't twinkle either, and that's the planet Mars. That's one of Dave F's favorite observations in the sky because as he told me earlier today in an email exchange, he said he really loves looking at it because the color is so distinct and so easy to see. So you can see that reddish color without too much difficulty. Now, when we say that Mars is the red planet, we don't mean red like blood red. What we really mean is something that's more of a rosy color or a salmon color, but the color is definitely visible. Again, if you use a pair of binoculars, that color will be enhanced. So I really highly recommend that you get that, use that, use those binoculars, use that telescope so you can see that. So three bright planets, easy to see. Now, if you're up early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, over on the Eastern horizon, coming up over there, the brilliant planet Venus. Uh, but if you're not up that early, hmm, okay, you have planets in the evening sky, but anybody up that early, check out Venus too. All right, what's another question, Linda? the Antares wildlife launch tonight. Oh, ha, ha, ha. The question is, what about the launch that's going to be happening tonight from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport? Hey, you're wondering, what's he talking about? Spaceport? Where's that? Well, as it turns out, there is what's called the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. It's at Wallops Island, Virginia, not very far from Philadelphia at all, about two and a half hours south of Philadelphia. And this is a launch facility that NASA has been using since the 1950s to launch mostly atmospheric research rockets, small rockets. But NASA has actually upgraded the site so that it can launch even larger rockets. Now, because NASA heard I was doing this program tonight, what did they do? they decided to set up a rocket launch just for us. Yes, that's right, folks. There's a launch right after this program tonight at 9.38 p.m. 9.38 p.m. from the Wallops Island facility, which, by the way, is now called the Mid-Atlantic Rocket. Oh, I, did I forget it just that quick? Yes, uh, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Rocket Launch Station, uh, Spaceport, Mid-Atlantic <laughs> Mid Regional Spaceport. Uh, what's going to happen is, a rocket's going to launch at 9.38 p.m., and this is going to be an International Space Station resupply mission rocket. So what they're doing is they're taking up all kinds of stuff that the astronauts on board International Space Station are going to need. Now, they aren't running out of anything on Space Station. This rocket is providing supplies that might get used nine months from now, but they like to stay very far ahead in the resupply so that they make sure that everything is there for astronauts to use. There may be one or two things that they'll use right away, but for the most part, these are things that they'll put in storage and they'll have on hand when they need them. So what happens? Rocket takes off at 9.38 p.m. It climbs up in altitude and then heads out to the south-southeast. So it's going to be actually flying south and away from Philadelphia. Now, supposedly, about 180 seconds after the launch, you might be able to see from Philadelphia some of the 
uh, I don't know, flame of the exhaust. I got to tell you, between you and me, I've tried this and I haven't been very successful. I'm sure others of you may have been more successful than I have been at seeing these from Philadelphia. But if you're living in Delaware or you're in Maryland and you hear this program and you're closer to that region, well, you might be able to see it, okay? So that's something that you can, you can try to do. If you want to find out more information, look up Northrop Grumman, northropgrumman.com, and they'll have on their front page a link to a map that'll show you uh, where it's going to be launching from and where it's going to be heading out to. So that's 9.38 p.m. tonight. Let's do one more question. Mike would like to know, is the black rectangle that's seen near the sun recently, is it real or just internet gossip? Ha, ha, ha. Mike wants to know about the black rectangle that has been reported as near the sun uh, on internet gossip. Yeah, well, I was out looking at the uh, sky today. And, you know, I'm, the, I'm one of those astronomers that, has a, that does a regular view of the daytime sky. In fact, I have telescopes that are specially equipped to look at the sun and uh, make it safe for me to observe directly. And uh, I got to tell you, Mike, I haven't seen anything like that. I didn't see anything like that today. Didn't see anything like that yesterday. In fact, I've never seen anything like that. And if you wanted even more context than this, there are a number of solar observing satellites that would show something like this if it actually were there. So it's all internet gossip, Mike. There's no black rectangles in the sky near the sun. No need to worry about anything like that. Uh, there's too many ways that we can defeat that particular uh, line of gossip. So uh, no worries about that. Thanks a lot for that question. Those questions, we'll get back to some more in a minute, but let's jump out to the uh, night sky and see what's out there. I'm gonna drag my uh, laptop over here a little bit closer to me. Uh, give me a second here, folks, as I just uh, reorient a few things here. It's gonna take me just a moment to get it all together. So uh, yeah, I know it's awfully close, but uh, we'll get this all squared away and figured out here. You know, this home studio stuff is a uh, you know, interesting sort of phenomena. Okay, there we are. Okay, so now, here we are. Okay, I'm gonna uh, jump out to my uh, screen here. Uh, I'm gonna go right out to here. We're gonna share this. And now hopefully you all can see the screen I'm set up on. Uh, I'm just gonna minimize my image here because we don't need to see me. Uh, but uh, let's go out and take a look at uh, what's happening in the sky. I'm gonna look, uh, use this really cool program that I always enjoy called Stellarium Online. Uh, Stellarium, I'm sorry, stellariumweb.org you can see the URL right up here at the top of the screen. Uh, there it is right there. And I'm just gonna make a few adjustments here. And uh, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna get rid of the uh, menu bar over here on the side, asking me to buy more uh, uh, in-app purchases. And here I have this really great program now that's a simulation of the sky that we see overhead at night right here from Philadelphia. Now, I've recommended this program before. This is a free program that anyone can get on their desktop or laptop at this URL, stellarium-web.org. I highly recommend it because it has great functionality. It's very easy to use. It's entirely intuitive, uh, which means it just doesn't, it doesn't take very much of a learning curve at all for you to learn how to use it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna reposition uh, us for orientation. And you can see where the horizon is now. You can see where the stars are. You can see some objects over there on the eastern side of the sky, but I'm just going to turn us around so we're facing south. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use my cursor, drag around under the letter W, you know what that means, and swing us right around to the south just like this. Now you can also see that I can adjust how much of the horizon I see and how much of the sky I, I can see here. And you can see that there are some controls down here that will give us different kinds of appearances as we need them, uh, but we'll use only what we need to use. So here we are, eight o'clock in the evening, as you can see. And if you wanted to check the time, you'd look right down here in this box on the lower right corner. And you'll see it gives the date as the year, 2020, the month 10, the day one. And just above that is the time uh, done in the 24 hour time system. So 2008 is eight minutes after 8 p.m. Well, as we look out here at 8.08 p.m., we can see right there in the south, Jupiter right here. And of course, Saturn right next to it. Now in this particular program, one of the cool features is that if you click on an object with your cursor, you can get information about it. You can identify the object. So there we go, we have identified Saturn 
And you can see that over here in the top left corner now, we have information about the planet and you can find all the information you'd like to know. If you wanna get rid of that, just click the X and out it goes. But you can see where Jupiter and Saturn are. They're pretty close to each other. In fact, they're getting a little bit closer to each other as time goes by. And then if we just look out across here over to the east, we can see there's the moon. The full moon has risen by now because in a situation of full moon, full moon always rises as the sun sets. So there we can see that the moon is up and just beyond that is the reddish planet Mars. Now, I mentioned observing Mars at midnight because it'll be higher up in the eastern sky. Right now, it's low enough that for some viewers, you won't be able to see it because it's down below the tree line or the building line. But if we uh, just move ahead a little bit in time, we can actually move it forward. And I'll show you that right now because I want you to see how to do this. I'm going to click over here on the date and time bar. I've expanded that now so you can see I have uh, a date function here that I can change with the up and down arrows. I have a time function that I can change with the up and down arrows. And so I'm gonna use the up arrow on the hours and I'm gonna advance us to 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight. So now you can see that Mars is up much higher in the sky, but guess what? Jupiter and Saturn are gone just about, right over there in the southwestern sky, just about to drop below the horizon. So the interesting thing about this is that this tells us that Jupiter and Saturn are beginning to set earlier and earlier in the evening. I'd recommend you use October as the perfect time to see those in the mid-evening sky. Rather than uh, having to be out too early or be out too late, why don't you do that right now? And then you can get that out of the way. So there we go. We have the moon, we have Mars, and you can also see that there's a word here for Uranus. So right out here somewhere is that very distant planet that you're not going to be able to see unless you have a big telescope under clear dark skies and then I'll give you a little hint. What you're seeing is just a little greenish disk anyway. It doesn't look like very much. Don't want to discourage you, but just so you have a real idea of what it's going to look like, that's what you have. Okay, so those are the planets that are available. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring our timing back to where we are right now. And that's 8 p.m. So that's 8.11 right there. And the reason why I want to do that is because I want to show you how the constellations are going to change as we move through the month. We're going to start first with how constellations look right now this month, and then I'll show you what the constellations look like as we move through the month. So I'm going to use the constellation art figure here, and you'll see that we now have constellation names, and we also have uh, constellation outlines. Now the lines that you see connecting the dots, like a gigantic connect the dots game, are really lines and dots that are used to give you a general outline that's related to the story of the constellation. A constellation really is an area of the sky. And that area of the sky also typically includes that figure that we're most familiar with. So let's add some of that too, just so we can see what that is. And then we'll come back. Okay, so here we are. We got the full Megillah going on here. We've got uh, the constellation names. We have the stick figures and we have the artwork as well. And you can see that the artwork sometimes gets close to other parts of the other constellations. But these figures that we see all tell a story. Okay, so when we look at any one of these, there's a story behind the figures that we see. All right, so let's let the artwork disappear for the moment so we can do a little bit of just straight astronomy. So right now, as you look at the sky at 12 minutes after eight in the evening, if you're facing south and you look directly up, you're gonna see these three bright stars right here. This one right here is called Deneb. There's Deneb right there. Over here is Vega right here. And down here in the constellation Aquila the Eagle is Altair. These three stars together make up a geometric shape that we call a triangle. It's the summer triangle, but the summer triangle is making its way across the sky toward the west. And these constellations are all embedded, if you will, or seem to be, uh, seem to have the backdrop of the Milky Way behind that. So as we come down from Cygnus through Aquila the Eagle and down through Sagittarius and on towards Scorpius, this is where the Milky Way crosses the sky right here. If you're under clear dark skies, you can see this band of milky light that sort of stretches down the sky. These are the arms of our galaxy. And of course our galaxy with its 350 billion stars, you can see the arm of our galaxy as we look out in that direction right down behind Jupiter and a little lower into Sagittarius 
is the direction toward the center of our galaxy right down here. So how is this going to change as the season moves on? Well, here's how it's going to change as the season moves on. I'm going to move us ahead one month if I can. So here we are using this date function. We're at October. I'm going to move us forward to November. I just made the jump to November 1st. And you can see that what's happened is that Cygnus, Aquila, and oh my goodness, look, Sagittarius is almost gone, have slid a little bit further to the west. And taking up the main position of the evening sky is this geometric figure marked by four stars with four lines connecting them. This is the great square of the constellation Pegasus. Now, Pegasus acts like a keystone of the fall sky. Why? Because at 9 p.m., in this time of the year, Pegasus is right in the center of the sky, almost overhead in the south. Perfect position so that it can lead you to other adjacent constellations. And this is how you use Pegasus as your map to the others. Remember, Pegasus is easy to recognize because these four stars make up the great square. And from here, you can get to the others. So let's go to the others that are included in this particular story about Pegasus. Now, Pegasus in Greek mythology is associated with about four other constellations. One is Cetus, right down here below the constellation Pisces. I know you all know Pisces because that's a zodiac constellation, but here's Cetus right down here. Let's go a little bit higher up in the sky, if you will, because there are three other constellations that are connected. One is Perseus right here. The other is Cassiopeia here. And last is Cepheus right here at the top of the sky. Now, these four constellations, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Cetus are connected to Pegasus. In Greek mythology, Pegasus is a flying horse. In this case, the horse is upside down. Here's the neck, the mane, the head, the nose. Here are the legs out here, front legs, back legs out here. Well, connected at this star right here is the constellation Andromeda. That's the other one that adds to this story. Now, here's how the story goes. You ready for this? It's like a Greek soap opera, just like we have soap operas today, almost the exact same thing. All right, so here we go. Cepheus and Cassiopeia are the king and queen of Ethiopia. They have a daughter named Andromeda. Andromeda is quite beautiful, but in fact, her mother is very vain. And her mother thinks that she is more beautiful than any of the Greek goddesses. Well, the Greek goddesses, having heard this, don't like this at all. They take umbrage at this. And as punishment for Cassiopeia, the queen of Ethiopia, having said this, they have decided to give her beloved daughter Andromeda to Cetus. Now, why give Andromeda to Cetus? Well, because Cetus actually is a sea monster. You know, there had to be a monster in the story somewhere, right? So Andromeda is chained to a rock by the sea, waiting for Cetus, the sea monster, to come grab her from the rock and take her back into the sea as punishment for Cassiopeia being so vain as to think she's more beautiful than any of the goddesses. Well, they are absolutely besides themselves with grief, with grief the king and the queen. So flying by, on Pegasus, the flying horse, is the hero Perseus, just returning from having killed the Medusa. Well, as he's flying by and he hears the wails of the king and the queen, he decides to fly down to see what he can do to help out. Well, what he does is he tells them that he can help them, but the cost is the daughter's hand in marriage. Well, they agree to this deal, and what happens is Perseus, on Pegasus, flies over to meet Cetus as Cetus comes up out of the sea. How is it that Perseus can possibly defeat Cetus the sea monster? Well, it just so happens that Perseus, and I'll use the artwork hopefully to make this show up a little bit better. Here we are. Perseus holds right here in his left hand at this bright star, the head of the Medusa, where he has separated the head of the Medusa from the body. Remember, the Medusa is the creature with the snakes, the hair as snakes, right? Well, and if you look at the Medusa directly, it will turn you to stone. Well, Perseus defeated Medusa by not looking directly, but by using a reflection in a shiny shield. 
he now takes the head of the Medusa, flying on Pegasus, out to meet Cetus, where Cetus looks at the Medusa, turns to stone, crumbles away, and then Perseus can rescue Andromeda from being shackled to the rock. Well, everybody's happy about this, the king and queen, and they agree to the marriage. But believe it or not, at the wedding, a huge fight breaks out. Well, there's so much more to the story. I'm sure you can really see how closely this comes to any kind of soap opera we might have today. So all of that story is tied up in these five constellations of Pegasus, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Cetus, not to mention Andromeda. So that's what's available for constellations in the evening sky. Now, right now, of course, it's not November, but it's October. So where can we find these constellations now at 9 p.m.? Very simple, very high in the eastern sky. You can recognize the great square without any problem at all. Andromeda is connected to the back end of Persia, Pegasus. So you can find that. And of course, Cassiopeia and Cepheus are up high with Perseus up above them. So you can look for those as the sky gets dark too. Now, let's just talk about the sky really quickly. Not clear tonight in the Philadelphia area, but coming up this weekend, we'll have some clear nights. And into next week, we'll have some nights to observe this as well. So you can get out and take a look for these without much difficulty. Uh, you'll be able to see the brightest stars at the very least. So you'll have some idea of where you can find these and use this map to help you figure out where you are. Don't try to learn all the constellations at once. Start out with one main constellation in which you can identify, say, the cross of Cygnus here. And then from there, having identified that one night, move to another constellation nearby, like Pegasus. Identify that shape. And then put the two together on the next night. And then you can leapfrog your way around the sky one night at a time. In about three weeks, or three, three weeks of nights of observing, say 20 nights of observing, you'll be able to identify all the constellations of the night sky. Not bad at all. So we've done the planets now, we've done some stars that are there, and now we can move on to some other aspects of, the, of what's available to be seen this evening. But let's take a few questions first. Linda, do we have any questions? I need to see it. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, so. Uh, hold on, I'll come back again, folks, in just a moment. So what do you have there, Linda? All right. A uh, question about Betelgeuse. If it collapses in our lifetime, would we be able to see the aftermath? Uh, the question is about the bright star Betelgeuse that's part of the constellation Orion the Hunter. Orion is a winter constellation. Betelgeuse is a bright star, bright red star that we can see at the upper shoulder of Orion. And the question is, if Betelgeuse were to collapse in our lifetime, would we be able to see the after effects here on Earth? Oh yes, we would be able to see the after effects here on Earth. Betelgeuse is a big star. It's some distance away from us, but it's a big enough star that if it were to explode and create a nebula, we would be able to see that nebula. In fact, the explosion would make the star flare up in brilliance so that it would appear quite bright for quite some time. And then over time, say, uh, several weeks to a number of months, the brightness would drop off. And if there's a nebula left behind, we would be able to see that nebula under dark, clear skies. Of course, a telescope would make it much easier. So yes, that would be possible to see that. What do you have Larry. next? Thanks, Larry. Oh, thanks, Larry. Appreciate that. Greatly appreciate it. Uh -huh. uh, Greg wants to know, do you work for NASA? Greg wants to know if I work for NASA. You know, Greg, I would love to work for NASA. Nope, I don't work for NASA. I do volunteer for NASA. I'm what's called a solar system ambassador. And I've had the opportunity to use uh, information and um, content and materials from NASA to help people understand about the, the missions that NASA has conducted exploring the solar system. So I do have that distinction of being a NASA solar system ambassador. I've also worked for NASA as an astrobiology ambassador. And that's a really interesting thing. I'll tell you about that some other time. Uh, I would love to work for them, but I've done a lot of work with NASA in so many different ways. Uh, grant, grant funded programs. Um, I worked with space shuttle program, with people in space shuttle program for various different aspects of that. I've done a lot of different things with NASA, but haven't worked directly for NASA. So I've never been a government employee of that type. Although, you know what? I would take a job like that in a minute. Oh, wait a minute. They didn't hear that down at the Franklin Institute, did they? I hope not. Never mind. No, let's not talk about that. Anyway, uh, sure. 
Uh, no, I don't. I work for the Franklin Institute right here in Philadelphia, but I love all the different kinds of things that NASA does. They do fantastic work. Uh, and uh, I'm all for uh, giving them another penny of my tax dollar. If we all gave them another penny of our tax dollars, uh, they would be able to do twice as much as they're doing now. So uh, uh, it's a great organization. They do good stuff. One more. Heather wants to know, does it really rain diamonds on Jupiter and Saturn? Heather. Ah, Heather wants to know if it really rains diamonds on Jupiter and Saturn. Oh, you looking to pick up a big diamond, are you? <laughs> well, that's trickier than you might think it would be. You know, what Heather is actually referring to is that inside the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn, these are such big planets and they are so massive that once you get inside the clouds and begin to head down toward the core of the planet, the atmospheric pressures increase so much that it's possible that pure carbon can be converted into diamonds. So I haven't been there or been inside, but theoretically, this is something that could happen inside those giant planets. We haven't sent any probes in to find out yet if that's the case, but theoretically, if there's enough free carbon and the pressures can get high enough, and all the other things that are necessary to be uh, on point are atmospheric pressure, the temperatures, the humidity, all those sorts of things. If everything is good, it's possible that diamonds can be formed in that way. So I think it's gonna be a little while, probably never, uh, that we'll find out that diamonds are actually being produced only because you have to go inside and you have to be subjected to the same pressures. So it's hard to create a spacecraft that, that can actually sustain, sustain that, kind of, uh, that kind of abuse of pressures. So we can look at it theoretically and imagine that that's the case. I don't think, we're gonna, I don't think uh, Tiffany is going to be sending anybody up or De Beers is going out there anytime soon to collect diamonds. But thanks a lot for the question, Heather. It's a really interesting one because it points to the fact that different environments around the solar system can create different phenomena that can never happen here on Earth. Our atmosphere doesn't have the pressure. Sat Venus doesn't have the pressure to create diamonds right out of the atmosphere, but Saturn and Jupiter do. So, and that's perfectly normal for planets like that to do that. So thanks again, Heather, that's a good one. One more. Let's give a quick shout out to Anthony now from Preston and Steve show. Hey, 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 Anthony, how are you? Anthony's online from the Preston and Steve show on WMMR. Thanks a lot for joining us, Anthony. Uh, great to have you here. I was just on Preston and Steve yesterday morning. So uh, it's great to have you here. Sometime maybe we should get Preston and Steve to come over to this program and we can do it that way. So uh, thanks for being in there with us, Anthony. Uh, thanks a lot. We'll catch you on the, on the radio soon again. All right, so uh, let's move on now. We have a couple of other things we wanted to do. So I'm gonna go back and share my screen once more here and we're gonna move on to something else. So I'll jump back over to here like this. I'm gonna close this program. I'm actually just gonna reduce this part of my screen. And I'm going to bring up this uh, one image that I have in the background here. And this one image I have in the background is related to the moons again. And I wanted to bring this up because as we looked at this from before, from last month, we can see that uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas uh, back in the early history uh, of this continent created names for the full moons of every month. And they did that because it was an easy way to divide up the year into recognizable chunks and easy to manage time chunks, if you will. Now, you remember, you have to keep in mind that, you know, the paper calendars that we keep and use, well, they, those haven't always been around. So people have needed ways to divide up the year. Now, of course, it's easy to do that by seasons because you can start with, you know, uh, the basic seasons as we know them. But to divide the time down even further, you can use things like identifying the full moons of every month. So here we have, uh, we have uh, the January moon, the full wolf moon, the snow moon, the worm moon, the pink moon. And this is January, February, March, April. And then on to full flower moon, May, June for strawberry, buck moon for July, sturgeon for August, corn for September, hunter for October, full beaver moon for November, and the full cold moon for December. Now you'll notice in these 12 moons, there's no harvest moon. Well, that would be the moon that would be here at September, the full corn moon. Now, as I mentioned these as one group of, may, <coughs> <coughs> 
excuse me, one group of names that was used by indigenous Americans for full moons, there's so many different groups that there are a number of different variations on the name. And that includes the full corn moon versus the harvest moon. So these that you see here provided by the old farmer's almanac, thank you very much, is one set of those. So here's where we are right now at the full corn moon, because this is when corn would be fully matured and ready for harvesting, or we would refer to it as the harvest moon. And then next coming up, is the hunter's moon, as I said earlier, that's coming up on October 31st of this year. So we have those two moons. Now, here's the interesting thing about having two full moons in a month. It doesn't happen all the time. It only happens every two and a half years that we have two full moons in a month, right? So this is one of those months where we have it just right on the first and on the 31st. Now, this is also related to the moon's orbit around the earth. The fact that the orbit is not perfectly circular, but is somewhat elliptical, and the way that the moon's orbital path and orbital period sort of intersect with how our calendar works allows us to have this situation where we can have two full moons in one month, okay? All right, so there's a more complicated way to actually map this all out, but we don't have to do that now, and it's something that you can look up if you're interested in that. Uh, even more. So you can do that. So now we've had a chance to look at the constellations. We've looked at the planets. Let's go on to the next things that are happening this month. There's some really cool stuff going on this month. Um, there are some special launches to look out for this month. So let's get those taken care of, and then we can go from there. Let's uh, just go right back down here. And if we come back up here, uh, let's see if we can Okay, great. So what I've done is I've brought up the, uh, the, uh, the YouTube video of the SpaceX Falcon rockets landing in tandem. I really love this video uh, because of the fact that uh, it allows us to see this sort of really, really cool phenomenon that has really made SpaceX stand out as a, a, a new company that's doing great work in space exploration. We've talked about them quite a bit before, but I just am gonna throw this video up there so that you can see this video uh, as it's happening. You're all familiar with this, but what's happening actually with NASA and SpaceX this month is that on October 31st, the Crew Dragon capsule is gonna send four astronauts up to International Space Station. Now, you'll remember that over the summer, there was the Crew Dragon Demo-1 mission in which two astronauts left in June, headed up to International Space Station, stayed until August, and then came back as a test of that particular capsule. It was the first time that humans had flown in that capsule, and that mission was very, very successful, worked out great, but it was just a test. This one's gonna be the first full up mission in which astronauts are gonna head up to International Space Station. So uh, that's going to happen on October 31st. And of course, you'll be able to follow that uh, online. You'll be able to watch it at SpaceX.com. You'll also be able to watch it at NASA. This is a joint NASA SpaceX mission. And this will be the first time since 2011 that NASA has returned astronauts to International Space Station uh, from American soil. So this is like a really major mission. And we're really looking forward to uh, having this happen. So uh, there we go. No audio with the Zoom. With the yeah, there was no audio with the SpaceX. I turned the audio off purposely because we didn't really need to hear the background chatter. But if you go to YouTube, you can look at it, you look it up, and you can hear the audio. It's really, really great stuff. Thanks for letting me know that. So the two special launches to look out for again this month, tonight at 9.38 p.m. from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, you can actually watch that online at northrupgrumman.com northrupgrumman.com you can watch that live online at 9 38 p.m this evening uh, and later this month october 31st the nasa spacex crew dragon mission that'll be taking place sending four astronauts to international space station okay so folks guess what you remember earlier i mentioned two things i talked a little bit about astronomy equipment and why it's important for us to think about looking for astronomy equipment now and also the mysticism that surrounds Halloween. So we're gonna finish off this evening with that mysticism part. 
So let's do the astronomy equipment now right up front. A little bit earlier, we talked about astronomy equipment. I have some right here I'm just going to pull out so we can take a quick look at. It. So I have a pair of binoculars here that I keep around that I use for sky observing. And these are really cool because they give me enhanced views of the sky. And uh, I can use these really easily. In fact, you might have these around home. So it might be very easy for you to pull these out and make use of these. These particular binoculars, these are uh, eight power. That means they have eight power of magnification. And the lenses on the front measure 40 millimeters in diameter. So uh, this is almost two inches in diameter on the front. And I have two of those. So I get great binocular views. But this might be a really cool gift that you might give someone along with a star map as a holiday gift. But the reason why I talk about them now is because you need to decide what it might be that you want to get now, and you need to order it if you're going to order it online by the end of this month. That way you won't run into any problems with supply or shipping so that you can get the gifts that you're looking for by the holiday season. So binoculars, of course, as I mentioned, are a really good choice for that. And, you know, of course, I've also talked about telescopes as being another one of those good holiday gifts. And I've got one here. This is a basic uh, refracting telescope that has a right angle eyepiece viewer on it. You can see right here. But again, the idea is that you need to figure out which one you think is going to work best as a gift for the person you might be considering getting it for. And that means you need to do a little bit of research. So where can you go to do that research? Well, at the Franklin Institute's webpage, uh, there actually is a little blog that I've written that explains all about purchasing a telescope, the things you need to know for uh, purchasing a telescope. And you'll find that on our webpage uh, under the observatory page. And you can go there and find out that information. The other thing you can do for research, I recommend it, telescope.com. Telescope.com happens to be your particular vendor. It's the Orion Telescope vendor site, but I recommend it because there are lots of different examples of telescopes there that you can pick and choose from that you can use to identify what telescope might be the best for you. There are also a number of tutorials online there that will help you figure out what, what type of telescope might be a good one to use, and you can get a good idea of pricing as well. Now, the one thing I like about them is that they actually have a warehouse right here in Pennsylvania. They're California-based, but they have a, a warehouse right here in Pennsylvania. So they can ship directly without any difficulty at all. They are a reputable company. You do not have to use them. I recommend them only because I know them well and I purchased equipment from them. But there are a number of other retailers that you can find around. Now, as I've mentioned before, if you'd like to go someplace and actually see telescopes right there in front of your face, there's a great place in Pottstown called Skies Unlimited. Skies Unlimited in Pottstown. You can go check out telescopes there. You can purchase from them and you can purchase through them. And these folks really know what they're doing. So I highly recommend them as retailers as well. So as I said, now here we are at the uh, beginning of October. It's a great time for you to begin to learn and understand more about telescopes and what you might consider purchasing as a gift. So. I highly recommend that. Figure that out now so that by the end of the month, you'll be all ready to go and you won't miss the date that you need to hit for getting things shipped to you by the holiday season. Okay, great. So last but not least, October. What a great month. Here we are in full swing of the change of seasons from summer into fall, and we can really begin to see it. The skies are clear, blue. The air is crisp and cool. The leaves are falling creating great color contrast between a green lawn, a blue sky, and the wonderful gold and brown leaves. But there's also the mysticism about October that really comes around at the end of the month around Halloween. Now, as it turns out, Halloween, October 31st, is the halfway point between the first day of fall and the first day of winter. It's what we call a cross-quarter day. This is another way in which earlier civilizations divided the year. You could divide it into the seasons, but if you divide the seasons in half, you come up with these very special days that we call cross-quarter days. You know several of them easily. You know Halloween as October 31st. You know February 2nd, right? What day is February 2nd? There's a pretty good movie named after that day, February 2nd. 
Yeah, Groundhog Day, right? So that's across quarter day, halfway between the first day of winter and first day of spring. And then what's the day that's halfway between the first day of spring and the first day of summer? You know that day. It's May Day. May 1st is across quarter day. The other one comes in the summer, in August, and it's called Lamas, Lamas. And so those days, all four of those days, make up these halfway points. Well, October's cross quarter day has extra special meaning because in certain religions, Halloween has a very special day because on that particular day, departed souls rise up at night under a full moon and they can roam around the planet for one night. And one of the ways that we sort of try to keep these spirits at bay is if we give them gifts of various kind. Now, this has all evolved down to what we do now in trick or treat, where the gifts we give have turned into candies. So these are ways to buy off the spirits. Well, as it turns out, that one night that they have, that one night is closed off the next day because that next day is known as All Saints Day. So we have the nights that the spirits are out. We have the day in which the saints push the spirits back. And then the very following day after that is All Souls Day. So Halloween is directly connected to religion, but it's also directly connected to astronomy. And all of these things work together to create the mysticism that we know that comes around Halloween. Now this year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna couple that with one other astronomical piece. And that is that two o'clock Sunday morning, what are we gonna do? We're gonna turn our clocks back one hour. We're gonna turn our clocks back one hour. And we're gonna do that to accommodate the shift in sunlight that we have. If we didn't turn our clocks back one hour, guess what? It would still be dark at 7.30 in the morning. We really don't want that, or eight o'clock in the morning. So what we do is we turn our clocks back so we can accommodate the shift in sunlight that we have. And that makes it easier for us to make our way through winter when we're up and about at six and seven and eight o'clock in the morning. So all of these things tied together help bring all of those images that we have there are the jack-o'-lanterns that mimic the full rising moons that could have happened at this time of year. That mysticism that goes with the full moon on October 31st, on Halloween. What's the other thing that you would expect to have happen on Halloween under a full moon? Yeah, you'd want to see a witch fly by the full moon, right? Well, we don't have to worry about that. We don't expect we're going to see anything like that on October 31st. But all of these things go together with the mysticism of that period of All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, All Souls' Day. All of those things wrapped up together help make this a mystical time of year, but the astronomy feeds in with it also. So on Halloween, think about how all this stuff goes together. In fact, you could look up some of the details about how Halloween has this mysticism and the astronomical connection as well, and you can learn the full story. So check that down. That'll be fun. All right, so let's do some more questions. We have just a few minutes left for our program this evening, but let's check out some more questions. What do we have, Linda? We have a proud parent named Stephen. He says his daughter is interested in astronomy. So what careers could she aspire to in astronomy? And who was that again? Stephen. Hey, Stephen, I understand you have a daughter that's interested in astronomy, and you're wondering what careers there are in astronomy. Oh my goodness, do we have another hour to talk about all of the different careers that are available for somebody in astronomy? I don't even know where to begin. Let's see. There's astronomy itself as a branch of physics where you understand what's happening out in the universe. But you know what? So let's say you're not a physics person necessarily, but you're still interested in astronomy. Well, guess what? If you were interested in biology, there's a branch known as astrobiology in which you try to understand how biological processes can manifest themselves out elsewhere in the universe. So there's astrobiology. Let's say you're interested in rocks. You're a geologist, but you're interested in astronomy as well. Well, there's astrogeology that you could consider as well. And that's the study of planets elsewhere in the solar system and around the universe. Oh my goodness, how much more is there? We can go on and on and on. Let's say that you're an engineer, for example. 
you could be someone who becomes a telescope technician who understands how telescopes, how big telescopes operate and what's necessary to make them operate. You could become an instrument maker. You could become an optician. Education. You could be a, a, a teacher. You could be an educator in astronomy. Um, there are so many different ways that, that, that you can go. Oh, did I, mention, did I mention computer programming as in coding for astronomy? Did I mention mathematics as an incredibly important piece of astronomy? I can't even begin to think of all the different ways, Steve, in which your daughter <clears throat> can find her niche in astronomy that works really well for her. Whatever it might be, if she's interested, she can go in that direction and she can find something. Oh, did I mention working for NASA? How many different ways can that happen? You can be a solar physicist. You can be an atmospheric physicist. You can, you can look at aurora. You can be a specialist in so many different kinds of things. My producer says, <laughs> we'll let that go. But there are so many different ways, Steve, that she can be interested in astronomy and still find a career path. And you'll find that if you look at graduate students in astronomy right now, the young graduate students in astronomy right now, they really are chasing down all of the different ways in which uh, they find astronomy exciting. And more and more women are obtaining graduate level degrees in astronomy as well. So while women uh, played a role in astronomy very much earlier on in the, in the uh, science as it developed, women are playing an even more prominent role in astronomy these days. So there's plenty of room for her to fit in. Thanks a lot, Steve, and encourage her to pursue this if she's interested. What's next? The Tracy would like to know, does the moon have layers like core, mantle, crust? What is the moon made of? Oh, Tracy is asking questions about the moon. Yes, the moon has an interior structure that's very much like the Earth, but we just have to forget about the molten interior. That part is done on the moon. So yes, there are stratifications and layers inside. The moon is a big hunk of rock, just like the Earth is. And if you look, Tracy, at the composition of the moon, you'll find out that all of the same uh, elements and minerals, many of the same minerals uh, that we find here on Earth are also found on the moon but it's the concentration of those minerals that's different. And the, uh, how do we say it? The family of minerals that are slightly different on the moon than they are here on earth that identify it as lunar material because the conditions under which the moon was made was, are slightly different than the conditions under which the earth was, was, was formed. So when you put all those things together, we can figure out by creating computer models of how an object like the moon should have formed and what kind of composition it should have, we can figure out how the moon came into existence. And we can use the moon rocks that were brought back from the moon as a ground truth, as the way to have a certainty about what the moon's composition is. So uh, out the window go the ideas of the moon being made of green cheese. It's just a big hunk of rock, just like Earth is a big hunk of rock. Thanks. The rocket behind you, people want to see it. They want to know if that's the Falcon model. Oh, Steve folks, to know. Steve is asking about the rocket behind me. Let me see if I can show it to you, Steve. This is, uh, this is a, oh, sorry, it's on the wrong side. You know, I'm doing the reverse view here. Here it is right here. So this is an example, Steve, of the Falcon, the SpaceX Falcon 9 launch vehicle. Uh, it's a 36-inch uh, tall model that came from SpaceX. It has a really nice base on it. It even has the, Exhaust, uh, exhaust cones from the rocket motors on the bottom. And right up at the top here, you can see where the, if I can get this down far enough, uh, where the payload goes right in here inside the fairings. There we go, now we can see it. My producer's telling me how to do this. And so as I bring it up, you can see SpaceX right down the front. There are even some steering fins uh, for the booster here. And uh, these are the landing legs that are right here on the bottom that actually fold down when the rocket comes down and lands. I really like this model. Uh, it was a great present that my producer, Linda, got for me. Thank you very much, Linda. You're so welcome. Cool, okay, what's up next? Okay, have you ever been to Cherry State Park in Potter County? They say it's the second darkest place on the East Coast. The question is, have, have I ever been to Cherry Springs State Park in Potter County, Pennsylvania? The answer is yes, I've been to Cherry Springs. It is one of the darkest sites on the East Coast, no question about it. Uh, it's a great place to go to. The park is all set up 
for uh, uh, sky observers to come out and look at the sky at night. They have special rules and regulations about lighting and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's a little bit of a distance away, about six hours drive. However, there are plenty of other dark places that are not so far away. In fact, if you go to the uh, Pennsylvania Tourism website, and also at Franklin Institute's website, we have a list of state parks that are specifically set up as uh, sky resource locations, places where they allow you to come in at night, uh, once the pandemic is over, where they allow you to come in at night, where you can look at the night sky, where they specifically preserve that pristine night sky at that location. So no extra lighting, uh, specific rules and regulations about lighting. And uh, there are lots of places that, uh, I should say it this way, there are still a number of places around on the East Coast where the sky can be quite dark. Right along the East Coast, where we have the metropolitan uh, sort of like throughway from New York all the way down to Washington, that's going to be difficult because of the light pollution that comes from the bright cities. But if you move inward, inland, west of that, uh, an hour or so away, inland from those coastal regions, you'll find that the sky gets pretty dark pretty quickly. If you have a chance to make it to Cherry Springs, I highly recommend you go. It is dark and they are well equipped to host you there. Great. Patty would like to know, if you had the opportunity, would you consider going to ISS? Patty is asking, if I had the opportunity to visit International Space Station, would I go? Patty, thank you very much for that great question. I would go to International Space Station in a heartbeat, no questions asked. I would love to spend time on International Space Station. I'd look forward to the launch up. I'd look forward to the time on board station and uh, would regret having to come back. But you know what? More than that, I really would like so many people on this planet to get a view of Earth from space. You know what astronauts say is they say, when you look down onto the planet from space, you don't see any political borders. So it looks like one whole planet all here together. The other thing that's really critical about that view of Earth from space is you can see how thin the atmosphere is that protects us from the horrible environment of space. So would I love to go? Yes, I'd love to go. And if I got a phone call right now from NASA asking me if I wanted to fly tonight, I'd be out of here going to do that. So sure, I'd love to do that. Question is, how about you? Would you do it? How many of you out there would want to take a trip to space? Let's say you could go visit Space Station for, say, a week. Would you do that? Maybe not a week. Would you go for a few hours on an afternoon? Maybe you'd like to do that. Just go up and see what it looks like and come back. Let me know. I'd be interested in finding out how many of you would do that. And then the big question, anybody here interested in going to the moon or going to Mars? I'd love to know that too. Yeah, Mars is a big one, but uh, you know, how about a weekend trip out to the moon? What do you think of that? Too bad. Okay. Nicole Nazaro says, hi, Derek. You helped me with a science project when I was at Ben Salem High School. Thanks a lot. Hi, Nicole. It's Nicole Nazaro who says I helped her with a project when she was at Ben Salem High School. I hope it worked out well for your science fair project, Nicole. And thanks for reaching out to us tonight. Glad you're part of the program. Get outside and look at the night sky. Take a look at those planets and, and, and enjoy them. What's next? What is the Star Walk app? Have you heard of that? And can you see the Milky Way? A question is, what's the Star Walk app? Star Walk is one of those apps that you can use to find your way around the evening sky. Star Walk itself is a little bit more sophisticated in that it allows you to uh, put a model of, of our solar system up on your screen on your computer, and you can sort of make your way around the planets and go visit the planets on your computer. So that's kind of a fun program. I like that. I do have that on my big desktop computer. Um, uh, but for my phone, I use apps that allow me to find my way around the sky outside at night. And there are a number of, of, of these programs that work really well and are inexpensive. So I highly recommend them. I'll give you the name of one really quickly, tell you which ones I think are really one that I think is really cool that I like to use. Yeah, so uh, here are a couple that I use and you can pick and choose which ones you like. Uh, Pocket Universe is one that I like that works pretty well. Pocket Universe is pretty cool. It shows you planets as well as stars and constellations and things like that. Go Skywatch is another one. Go Skywatch. I like that one. And there's another one called 
Night Sky, that's also pretty cool. And a number of these uh, apps these days are adding music to them. So you can be out under the night sky looking for various constellations and have some really cool background music as well. So I think the ones that I recommended are all free, free, and they all work really well. So I have no problem with that. And of course, you know, Stellarium also has a, uh, a version that works on your smartphone as well. And again, it's free, so you can use that. All right, so we've done a lot this evening. Uh, we've answered a lot of your questions. If we have, if you have additional questions, please send them along. If we didn't get to your question, I'll answer your question after the program. Thanks a lot for writing in. We greatly appreciate it. So tonight, what we did was uh, we talked about astronomy equipment and the need to think about what equipment you, you think you might be considering as a holiday gift, because by the end of the month, you might want to order that since you might be doing it online. You want to make sure that the uh, retailer doesn't run out of supply, and you also want to make sure that it can get shipped in time. We talked about the blue moon this month. Tonight is the first full moon of the month. October 31st is the second full moon, two full moons in a month. A blue moon, it won't look blue, but also think about how this matches with Halloween. There's gonna be a full moon on Halloween. That hasn't happened in a little while, but there's the mysticism that goes with that. That's all tied to a number of religions and they all match up together at this particular time on which we have a cross quarter day, uh, October 31st. We've got some really cool constellations that are coming around this fall that we can see all connected to the constellation Perseus. You can, I'm sorry, connected to the constellation Pegasus. You can start there with Pegasus, fill out the story and the constellations from there. I highly recommend the stellarium-web.org uh, star map that I've been using here. And uh, the planets that are available, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, all out there and easy to see without any problem at all. Special launches that are happening this month, October 31st, the SpaceX NASA Dragon crew mission to International Space Station, and tonight at 9.38 p.m. from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, uh, the International Space Station Supply Mission. You can watch that online at northropgrumman.com. So check that out. Again, uh, shout out to the night skies at the observatory crew volunteers. Thank you, folks, uh, for all of your help over the years. I greatly appreciate that. Don't forget folks, learning about the night sky is actually pretty straightforward and very easy. And the other thing about viewing the night sky is, you know, in these times right now, when things are so confusing and things are so up in the air, going outside to look at the night sky can really give a wonderful calming feeling. It can give you some solace. It can give you some sort of a chance to take a deep breath and step back from all the craziness that's happening right now and you can find a little bit of peace and quiet just gazing out into the universe. So remember, it's easy to look at the night sky. It's easy to see all these things. I encourage you to do it. I also encourage you to take some family members out and see this and recommend this to your friends. It's a really, really cool thing to do. Remember, it's your universe. Get out and explore it. Thanks a lot for being with us. We'll be back next month on November 1st. We'll see you then with the next edition of Night Skies at Home. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget, Franklin Institute is open, so you can come visit us too, Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, check it out online. You can buy your tickets online. Come down and see us. Thanks a lot, folks. Take it easy. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah, too bad the sky isn't clear tonight, but over the next couple of nights it will be clear. So